Okay. So now we're back in here. This is the ultimate winterization is princess parking, as I was saying. <clears throat> and we decided today to princess park everybody's rig. So they're all inside. Bert's, Austin's, mine, all of our dailies. Uh, so that will make them a little nicer. But if you, uh, if you go to winterize your vehicle coming up from outside, and the oils used to be a lot worse as far as what they would do. The uh, Datsun that I was talking about pulling around 77. And it might have had 140 weight in it. Um, it could have. It could have been 90. I don't know. It was definitely not synthetic. And even 90 weight back then, it probably was 140 in that one, actually. Uh, and 140 was more commonly used for gear oil in those days because the gear oils weren't as durable either. <clears throat> older gear oils, all the older oils. There's, there's been improvements. Anyway, we towed it for about three miles before it would turn. And then it also had fairly stiff engine oil. And then you put the transmission in gear and you start turning the engine over and making the engine warm so that we could get it. And that was all so that we could get it in a building to be able to winterize it. Is why we had towed it so much, getting it going so that it would go into a building. Uh, had we been more affluent, we might have uh, hauled, called a wrecker or something, but eh, it was pretty common just to do things the get it going, get it, get it done way. Yet at that same time, if you got a bottle, synthetics were just coming out. This was 1979. Synthetics were just coming out. Um, you could get zero, I think zero W10 which was a synthetic and not real impressive when it was hot, but it would flow and you could get oil pressure right away. So a lot of people were starting to use it, but it was like $20 a quart versus under a dollar a quart for regular oil. So it wasn't something that everybody did. Also, your normal 530 at that time, and fortunately they were not the bottles, they were the round, uh, oil cans, you could not pour it at 20 below. It would not pour in your engine. So you cut the top out, you'd take a tablespoon, and you'd start dumping it in to the valve cover, and the heat from the valve cover would melt it enough so it would run down, you know, when you had to add a quart. A lot of times you would leave a quart on the defroster in your vehicle. Also, uh, we had, you can see the frost coming here on the windows, and it was on the windows while we were driving. But we had a thing called frost shields, which you just don't see anymore. Real common, they, they used to be real common in, in uh, Canada also. And they were sort of a nuisance, but a necessity. And what it was, was just a piece of plastic <clears throat> that gave you a second wall, and it would glue on your window. They came in different sizes. They had little ones. Sometimes you'd have three of them on a window. Sometimes you'd have one bigger one and it would give you the same idea as a thermal pane. So it gave a little bit of insulation there so that you had a part of your window you could see out of, that it wouldn't frost so bad on. And that was because the heater cores in the older vehicles were smaller. And as we got bigger heater cores from the 85 on type vehicles and people, um, the other fix, a lot of people on older vehicles would put in a second heater. And with the second heater, uh, it was usually pretty good. Problem that a lot of us have nowadays, we've got cabs that would put out enough heat, but our engines are running, our diesels run colder. So we're running diesels for miscellaneous reasons why we like to run diesels, but you don't get the waste heat out of it that you do for a gasoline engine. There's two reasons for that. One is because of the efficiency of the engine and diesel people always, oh, that's because it's so efficient. That's, there's another reason too. It also is overcooling itself when it's cold out because the cycle of it always draws the full volume of air that the turbocharger boosts. You get lots of air going through. It's always an oxygen rich environment, which is why it's efficient for the most part. But that's also why when it's 40 below, it won't stay warm. It's not just a liquid cooled engine. It's also an air cooled engine where the gasoline engine you restrict the oxygen coming in, and so you're, you're running with less air going through it. You're not cooling it off with 40 below air all the time. So, um, 
when you winterize them, you want to have an oil pan heater on. You want a block heater on the engine, and the best ones are ones that go in the block itself. Actually insert into the block so that you're heating directly into the block water. If for some reason you can't go into the block water, there are circulating heaters. They're basically little percolators, just like an old style coffee pot. There's a little check valve in there and because of it boiling, the water moves and then it closes off. <coughs> it won't move till it boils again and the alternate boiling and, and cooling off causes it to move the water. And you put those in from a low point to a high point. There's also um, diesel fired ones, propane fired ones. Problem with the propane fired heaters is you've got to keep the propane warm. When it gets down below 40 below, the propane doesn't come out of the tank anymore. Actually, 44 below, but it, at 40 below, in fact, at 30 below, it really doesn't come out enough. I used one for a few years when I didn't have electricity, and it was nice, but when it got real cold out, it was back to using a weed burner. Now, why could I use a weed burner on propane when I couldn't use the propane heater? And that was because I turned the weed burner on the bottle itself to warm up the propane along with warming up the vehicle where the heater in the vehicle just came off of a cold tank. I thought about different, in fact, we even tried one. We, we put a little water loop going into a little can so that it could help heat it up and make that work better. <sighs> your bottle's gotta be mounted underneath your engine and, there, and you end up with, we made it work with a little five pound bottle, but what's the point? The bottle was too small. A 20 pound bottle wouldn't fit under the hood. We tried to extend the water loop it out and get enough thermosiphon and it just wouldn't put enough heat out. So it didn't work. You'd, all you were doing was burning the propane to heat up the bottle if you got enough of the heat there and you had nothing left for the engine. So uh, <laughs> I think the diesel ones are pretty slick. They will drain down your battery because they take uh, 12 volts. There's the S-bars, which I say that one because I've got it. Uh, not on this pickup, in fact, not on any of my pickups. I just bought it and haven't put it on yet. Um, there's the Wabasto, which is, uh, I think they've been around longer. There's a whole bunch of Chinese ones, uh, and the Chinese ones are basically the air heaters, the S-bar and the Chinese heaters are pretty much the same for the ones that heat the air in the cab, but the ones that heat the engine, they're different and the Aspar has got more water exchanger in it than the Chinese ones. So it's more efficient as far as the engine heater goes. Um, and uh, so, so they haven't really made the market the way they have for the little air heaters that people are using for fishing shacks and all kinds of things now too. Um, so what we used to do with well and then there's another way you do that too. So when we're back to electric you've got the circulating electrics You've got your ones that go right into the block that fit uh, somewhere in the block. There's different uh, configurations according to your engine. And if you don't have a spec on the engine, if you have a core plug or what they call a frost plug, which is a name for it, right or wrong, it's a name for it. Um, <clears throat> if you see those in the side of the block, you can generally get a heater that will go in for that size but you need to look at the block carefully because if you're dead centered over a cylinder, there's no room to put it in. When you look up in a catalog, there's normally a layout. If it's a common engine, there'll be a layout of where it is, where it goes. Well, we can look at an engine over here real quick. As long as we're chatting about different stuff, this little 4BT. So, oh. Darn it. Here, here we can see, we can see over here and over here we have the plugs out right now. This one, we're in between two cylinders. You can see the cylinders and we're in between them. So that's a good place for a heater. And we're in between two cylinders there. If you know where a cylinder bore actually is, and it's hard to tell sometimes because the valve layout, the injectors, but like this, you could look before you ever pulled the plug out and you could see that there's gonna be a cylinder, a bore about here and one about here. So you would figure this is a good plug to pull. 
This one is a little more offside when you look at things, so it wouldn't have been quite as good of a guess, but as it turns out, it's pretty much got clearance in there. Some engines, even if it's in between bores, there's not enough room for you to get the heater in. And then what size heater can you buy? And you know, if I have my choice on an engine for a V8, I'll, if you got a V8, put one on each side. Don't just do one side. Don't leave the other side cold. Um, it'll start with the four probably, but it's better to have it start with all eight of them. Be nice to it, heat up both sides. Now, let's say there's no way we can do that. There's not good fittings uh, to put on a circulating heater or we don't wanna mess with a circulating heater. An alternate thing that people will do, now you wouldn't wanna put it on this side because there's, uh, you've got a cover here is all you would have to put your heaters on but you can use the regular silicone heat pads and you can glue them onto the side of the block or the head. You can get them in different sizes and it will take more of them, but you can get heat into the engine that way. The other thing, you want to heat up the oil because you want to have the oil where it will flow when you first fire it up so that you're not damaging the engine. It'll fire up. A lot of them will fire up without the oil pump working at all. And uh, several people have ruined engines by doing that. Just get it to fire up and don't worry about the oil pressure. And yeah, the oil pressure comes on 10 minutes later. It's not real good on the engines. Also, even with a manual transmission, a little bit of a heater on the transmission is nice. <coughs> it's not generally essential, um, but it's nice to have a little bit of heat on your drivetrain too. The differentials are not a problem unless you've got way, way too thick of oil in there. Um, generally the newer stuff, the transfer cases are running ATF and while it, the automatic transmission generally wants to be heated to shift well and function, as far as the gears, it would lubricate the gears okay without being heated. And so the newer transfer cases which run ATF are generally okay without heat. It doesn't hurt to heat, heat all the stuff extra though. In the old days there were two, well there was the no heater situation and a real common one that is used is just a either a master um, coring heater, rocket heater, whatever you want to call them and then a distributor that distributes out to the side and keeps the heat, the direct flame off of your oil pan or people would also do the same thing but just with a piece of pipe and let the flames go up to the oil pan <coughs> and uh, try to gap it so it wasn't burning up the engine. Sometimes you had fires, sometimes you didn't. The way I would end up doing that was the, uh, the pipe and then a weed burner, a propane weed burner because it was cheaper and it went everywhere, generally because of the, the portability of it. You get your master heater, your rocket heaters, and part of what happens there is when the heater's too cold, it doesn't want to come on. They get down below 20 below, they get pretty finicky. So now you got to drag your stupid heater in the building, in your garage. Well, well if you had a garage, why don't you just pull the car in the garage? Um, and that brings up another thing. When we're not in Princess Parking, like Austin will have his outside, he will put a blanket over the front of it. We'll put a regular blanket over the front of it, not just the plug in for the vehicle, but put a blanket over it to keep the heat in. Some people will have garages that don't have heat in them, but the fact that the vehicle is warm, they'll pull it in, it's an insulated garage, close the doors, and it's better than being totally outside. It helps keep it a little bit. Um, wind will make a difference, but not as much as it does on other things. It's not, you can't just look at a, a wind chart and say that it's this cold in relation to it because when the oil gets to 20 below, it's only 20 below. It doesn't matter how much wind you go across it, that's all the colder that oil got. Um, what's that? Cardboard. Oh yeah, cardboard from the radiators. Yep. Yep. Well, that's the common to do. Fact is, we got a couple things here on this one. 
Yes, we got cardboard in front of the radiator, all the way across the radiator. And we've gotten to where we have fancy ones that are actually labeled for second gen RAM. We got them labeled for what they fit, so we don't have to cut and make up new ones until we totally wear them out. They'll, they'll make it for three or four years before we have to get a new piece of cardboard. We, we could afford to buy the other cardboard, it's just easier, simpler. It's already cut, already taped. Uh, having it fold over a little bit helps. If you put them straight down and they may lock a little bit at the bottom, many times they'll wiggle loose and then you lose them out on the highway and they don't hurt anybody but you've just lost your cardboard. The little fold help, helps hold it there. <coughs> just put a new thermostat in this one so it was a little bit nicer but also there's factory bypass hose here that I thought was a little excessive for bypassing around the radiator. I blocked it off and it made the cab nicer and warmer. I'm sure that's not factory approved, but uh, I thought I'd try that first. And I don't know if I'll put plugs or a valve in there or just uh, leave it like that for the winter and I can pull it off for the summer. If I was pulling with this truck, that might be a problem as far as overheating. But uh, this one is just a, <clears throat> just a town grocery getter. Um, then the next thing, another thing that we had on oil pans was we had, <coughs> before they had the silicone pads, those silicone heat pads are relatively new. As in the 45 years that I've been here, they're relatively new, but they've been out there for well over 30. Anyway, what we did at first, a real common one for a plug-in oil pan heater, instead of using the propane, the, the rocket heaters, they made one that was an engine heater for a Volkswagen. And it went in place of the little bottom oil, oil plug that came out, little uh, take screws. People with Volkswagens know what I'm talking about on the bottom of the case. I, I don't remember how it's originally set up, but it gives you a little bit of an extra well underneath there and an, a 600 watt element sat in that and would help heat up your oil. and. 600 is a lot of wattage in the small amount of oil that's in a Volkswagen, but you got lots of aluminum around it radiating heat out too, because it's an air-cooled engine, it's an open, um, 40 below, it, it took quite a bit. So they made, and they're still available. And what people would do, because they found out that those would not burn out if they were ran in the dry air. They don't need the oil. So what they would do is they would take plumber's tape uh, or, um, yeah, plumber's tape usually, but then also sometimes hook hose clamps in with it is a better way to do it, so you get it up tighter. Anyway, and clamp that up to the oil pan, just so it sort of held it there, and then it would get hot and help warm up your oil. Uh, and they also had magnetic ones, which you can still get. Pretty much nobody uses the magnetic ones because they fall off. Uh, the idea of that is you use it on the vehicle that does not have an oil so you can bring it into the shop and put a regular silicone heater on. When you're putting the silicone heaters on these oil pans and stuff, get it clean. Pretty much any silicone works but the ultra series of silicone, the higher end, I've had better results with as far as them staying on and not falling off. Put, put a, get it at a, a pretty smooth spot, put your coat of silicone on, put a coat of silicone on the heater, put it up, roll it just like you're rolling some linoleum or something so that it's, so you work all the air bubbles out. And a lot of times it will want to try and fall off while it's first on there. Don't plug it in trying to use the plug-in heat to uh, cure it better. That just burns and they fall off and burn up. Um, what you really want to bring it into a warm building. And you let it set there overnight is best or for a whole day. I have sometimes when I've had ones that were really finicky, I've added duct tape across them. And if the duct tape burns off later, it's no big deal. Um, one thing that's really a problem while you're trying to get it to stay up there when it's first sticking is the weight of the cord. Don't forget the weight of the cord. Go ahead, run the cord, tie up the cord. If you leave that whole little uh, back and forth cord weight, it will pull off from the cord. It will fall off. You need to do something with the cord weight so the cord is not pulling it down while you're trying to get it to stick on to things. They make little itty bitty ones that are pretty good wattage and you want to watch where you put those. They're good to put on where you've got 
Try and stay down in the level of where the liquid oil is. Don't go up high on oil pan where you're, you're just going to start making coke and burning oil. You want to be down in the liquid oil. You don't want to get too much wattage for the gallons of oil because then you will start burning your oil too. Uh, if you plug it in all of the time when it's warmer out, you should probably change your oil in your engine a little sooner, uh, a little sooner interval through the winter, even though you'd think that the oil's not getting too hot. It's getting too hot because the heater is enough heater for 40 below, means that it's too much when you're plugging it in at 20 above. I don't normally plug in at 20 above myself. So you, you kind of bounce that all out. And uh, recommendations for how much heater. What do I put on the Cummins with 10 gallons? Honestly, I forget what I've decided what's the best on these. <laughs> I had a number in my mind that worked real good. I knew it was right, and I'm not sure what it is now, so I'm not going to tell you. Everybody, you can write it down in the comments. Some of you are going to be from Canada and Alaska and whatever. Um, it's more than 50 watts, and it was less than 200. I don't remember what I what I put on them now, normally now. I, I just don't remember. It's, the last few years I've been having other people do my winterization for me. So while I say do this and do that, it's, it's different than when you're actually doing it yourself every winter on something new or replacing heaters. And in the fall, it's good to go underneath and check the plugins. That's another one too. Um, a lot of my vehicles, like this one here, was already winterized when I got it, to, at least to some extent. This has got a, a cord block here, and you can plug it in. That works. It also works if you cut the ends off the cords and you connect them all together. Soldered heat shrunk connections are real good. One that used to be real popular here, and I've got it on one of my vehicles yet, is where they'll mount a regular household electrical box in on the fender. You'll see this on a lot of older vehicles here. Some new ones, some, some shops still do it and brag about it. The plug-ins are not really rated from the road vibration. The plug-in falls apart. So it falls apart, the plugs fall out, it shorts out. It's, it's just a nightmare for no reason. Yes, it's cute, you can plug in extra things, but it's better to just wire them. Another thing that helps is uh, your batteries. Now, for your batteries, a lot of people will put, say, go get a battery heater. Battery heaters are a little iffy, and you're, you're putting your heat through a case, and you didn't do as much as you do if you heat the battery internally by putting a, regula a uh, charger on it. You need one that regulates um, a, what's that? Yeah, 3%. 3% battery? Three, 3% battery? What's a 3% battery? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, you, you uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, put a charger on there. Uh, a two amp charger is pretty good. A one is marginal, but not bad if you have a real small battery. If you've got dual batteries, you could go as high as a four amp. Automatic regulation is the best. They're harder to find, though, that work right away when you turn them on anymore. They're too fancy and not as nice as actually the older ones general condition of your fluids and things you're doing. Brake fluid. Um, every couple years, even if you haven't had reasons to open up the system, it's good to drain some out of your bleeders, put new fluid in it. Stuff up in the reservoir, you can just suck it out, get rid of it, put new. It takes on moisture. As it gets more moisture, it's even more of a problem as far as not returning and being slow to apply the brakes like we were having out there. So that's something to deal with. Power steering fluid. Most specifications for power steering fluid are too thick for the Arctic. They used to say use power steering fluid. Well, they used to just plain say use automatic transmission fluid. And then they said use automatic transmission fluid or power steering fluid. And for whatever reason, the people that make specific power steering fluid, they make it too thick for the Arctic. They, uh, some of the manufacturers say use Pretty much everybody uses automatic transmission fluid for their power steering. It works much better. Uh, <coughs> I like to, you can go a little bit extra, it's not that expensive, and get a synthetic automatic transmission fluid. It's a little more, but the standard power steering fluid, 
it don't work. It will ruin hoses. It will ruin all kinds of things. It's just bad. It's just bad for up here. Um, uh, antifreeze. Mix your antifreeze strong. Uh, the ideal is 67%. And I just go basically go one to one to two, you know, which is pretty close. 66, 67. Yeah, it's close. And I mix it. And sometimes for makeup, you might carry a makeup bottle of a 50% because the water will evaporate out before the antifreeze. If you're always just adding pre-mixed uh, high concentration, it can get a little bit too much pure antifreeze. And the pure antifreeze will get sluggish before the ideal mixture. Now, as far as freezing, <coughs> Um, it can be protected to quite a bit less of a rating. It can have a small, I'm not going to say what amount, but it can have a small amount of antifreeze and still keep it from breaking in the winter. But what it'll do is it'll be little ice crystals inside of a liquidy structure of material. So it won't be, if you fired the engine up, the, the, all of the ice crystals will go to one side make a block, freeze, the, keep the circulation from happening, it'll overheat, freeze, blow out, it won't work. But as far as keeping it from breaking, a lot of times if you don't have a lot of money, uh, if you have lots of vehicles and they're just, you don't want to drain them out, but you can go to a lesser amount and it won't break even at 60 below, but don't go out there, fire it up and think you're going to run it. Um, Make sure your batteries are good. Make sure your cables are good. Um, one of these friend of mine <clears throat> had a terrible time. He put new batteries in it, and he started it for about six years, and he didn't know that one of these batteries was totally broken in two. He was just fighting with one. So after that, he said, wow, those were a really good battery. <laughs> Instead of cussing the battery after he found out he'd been starting it on only one, he was pretty impressed with the battery even though it didn't do what he wanted. Just keep things in, in uh, decent shape. And, uh, and it's going to be hard on it, you know? The years of a vehicle up here in the Arctic, uh, not necessarily terrible if it's garaged, especially if it's garaged and only driven in the summer, but something that's been driven and started up outside takes a lot of life out of it. I would say starting it up outside versus here versus starting it up outside in warmer climates is about three to one for the damage on the vehicle. And, uh, but if you get the one from outside, it came up here, wasn't well winterized, and they drove it for one month, it could have done 10 years of damage to it. So just the fact that it came up from outside doesn't mean that it's a good bet. If you brought it up and it was low mileage and you winterized it properly, that's a different story. Lots of fun, lots of fun. It's just part of day to day up here though. So 